the Romans crucified thousands of Jewish rebels. The name of only one has been revered for 2,000 years. Jesus of Nazareth. Now, new discoveries are providing unprecedented insight into the details of his life. And allowing science to recreate the world into which he was born. Provide new evidence about the missing years and the turbulent times in which he grew up. There is no doubt that Jesus of Nazareth existed. The historian Josephus is one of 80 first and second century writers who describe Jesus as a wise man who worked wondrous deeds. He also writes that Jesus was sentenced to death by crucifixion. Pontius Pilate was the Roman ruler who condemned Jesus to die. Archaeologists have now found the seat of his power. Just 60 miles northwest of Jerusalem is one of the most powerful Roman enclaves in the world. In the time of Jesus, it was called Caesarea, and it was the headquarters of the Roman occupation of Judea. Proof of their awesome presence remains even after 2,000 years. The Romans built this aqueduct to bring fresh water from the north. Enough evidence also remains of the street plan for archaeologists to recreate what Caesarea looked like. The city was completed under King Herod in 22 BC, when it was declared headquarters of Roman governors, including Pilate. In the heart of the city lay the temple to the Roman Emperor Augustus. The only other major structure to have survived the millennia is the theater, now restored and used for performances. From the air, it's still possible to see even more proof of ancient Roman dominance, the outlines of an ancient harbor now covered by the sea. This was a strategic port from which Pilate ruled first century Judea with an iron hand. Each execution served as an example of his terrible power. And he wouldn't have hesitated to get rid of a young troublemaker from Galilee. The execution of Jesus is also well documented by several sources. Crucifixion was a common method of execution. At this biblical museum in Jerusalem, they've erected a series of what historians think were typical Roman crosses. The Romans were inventive people. They adapted olive trees to crucify their victims. Hundreds of thousands of people died in this way. 
The idea that each cross was built from scratch is a myth. Well, this thing would have been in the place of crucifixion permanently. The individual would have carried the crossbar. Now, this device here, this is what, it's, what is called a seticule, this could or could not be there, depending upon how long you wanted the person on the cross. By putting this up on the cross, the individual can sit on the cross, okay? He's tied to the cross or nailed to the cross. But what happens is he's sitting up here, and what this does is simply prolongs the agony. The Jewish historian Josephus confirms that Jesus was a real man who lived and died, but he tells us little else. The full story of Jesus' life comes from the Gospels, his mysterious birth, his remarkable mission, and the events that led to his death. But the Gospels were written by early Christians, at least 40 years after Jesus died. So it's often argued that they're the work of converts, based only on oral records, and therefore can't be trusted as reliable historical documents. But breakthroughs in science and archaeology today are making it easier to establish what actually happened. The biggest break came in 1947 with the discovery of ancient Jewish scrolls in caves overlooking the Dead Sea. Written in the years leading up to the time of Jesus, the Dead Sea Scrolls reveal the violent and tense world in which he lived. It is a vibrant world in which so many arguments are going on. We're finding evidence of purity laws, stone vessels. We're finding arrowheads, spears. There are some people living here that believe that they were really in a war. And that's where Jesus fits in. It's a life that makes sense because we're understanding the context. The Daily Market in Bethlehem, a town five miles south of Jerusalem. Today it has a population of 30,000 Palestinians. The story that Jesus was born here appears in the Gospels of both Matthew and Luke. But even they don't always agree on the details. Luke gives us the famous story that when Mary and Joseph arrived in Bethlehem, exhausted by their long journey from Nazareth, there was no room at the inn. But in Matthew's Gospel, the journey isn't even mentioned. Maybe there was no journey. Maybe they were already living in Bethlehem. A closer look at ancient Bethlehem may help paint a more accurate picture of exactly where Jesus was born. This is Bethlehem as it looked 200 years ago. Because it was painted before the town was modernized, archaeologists believe it's an indication of the town's size and layout in the first century. Together with the archaeological data from Yatta, it's possible to recreate what Bethlehem would have looked like at the time of Jesus. Villages were built on hilltops to give a sense of security. 
Rooftops were used as living space during the mild weather. Most villages only had a few hundred people, but a town like Bethlehem would have been home to about 1,000. Today's houses in Yatta also reveal that caves and mangers were very much a part of first century domestic life. We have a room here which was used during the winter for the animals. This, first of all, it did two things. It kept the house very, very warm and again in terms of safety it was very good for the animals. Although under one roof, people lived apart from the animals. This manger is located on the first level of the house. Upstairs is this facility here which was used for people. During the winter it would have been very comfortable here, the animals giving heat below. So would babies born 2,000 years ago have shared house space with animals? The evidence can still be found in Palestine. Only 15 miles from Bethlehem in a secluded valley is another settlement. Here, a small and isolated community of Palestinians and their animals eke out a living. <laughs> and the caves aren't just used as stables. Goats and sheep feed from the manger at one end. At the other end are living quarters, the kitchen and the sleeping area. It's quite normal for animals and people to share the same living space. The mystery is why Mary would have laid Jesus in a stone manger down with the animals. There's a clue in Luke's gospel when he writes that there was no room at the inn. The original Greek word for inn, kataluma, can also mean upper room. So Jesus may have simply been placed in a manger because there was no space in the upper room for the rest of the family. The story goes that Mary, Joseph, and the infant were surrounded by strangers. Very good, very nice. Good, yeah, it's very beautiful. She helps run a workshop reviving ancient craft skills. You know what the she is also an expert on the way first century women lived. Yeah. Bringing a baby into the world in the first century was the single most dangerous thing that a woman ever faced in her whole life. Although we often picture them riding on a donkey in the pouring rain on December 24th in the darkest night of winter and Mary is in labor, huddled over, and they arrive in Bethlehem, and Joseph goes from motel to hotel to hospice, knocking on every door and being turned away. In fact, if we really read the text of Luke chapter 2, we would see that that isn't what the story tells us. Instead, it says they went to Bethlehem, which was his ancestral home, and that means that they probably had relatives there, aunts, cousins, perhaps mothers and mothers-in-law, there to bring this baby into the world. It's said that the birth of Jesus was heralded by a bright star that shone over Bethlehem. It would guide three wise men traveling from the east to the spot where the baby they believed was their savior had been born. The story's often been dismissed as a fairy tale, but now that view is being challenged. A new theory indicates that the star of Bethlehem 
may have been based on astrology instead of astronomy. Now, many people for decades and hundreds of years indeed have said this is not possible. No Jew was interested in astrology until the Middle Ages. Lo and behold, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find two horoscopes with astrological signs, with astrological ideas. So astrology is certainly there in the time of Jesus. In Jesus' time, astrologers were hired to foretell the birth and death of kings. To do this, they tracked the movements of the largest planet, Jupiter, known as the King of Planets. Michael Molnar, an astronomer, argues that the key place to look, not just for Jupiter, but for other signs of special stellar activity, was in the sign of Aries. During the reign of King Herod, astrologers believed that Aries of Ram symbolized his kingdom, that is Judea, Samaria, the lands that uh, he controlled. The stargazers also knew that there was a prophecy that the Messiah was about to come and conquer the world and rid the world of tyranny. So they were watching very carefully Aries the Ram for the advent of the Messiah. In certain rare alignments, Jupiter could actually appear as an extraordinary star instead of a planet. Charts for Aries in 1 AD, the traditional year that Jesus was born, reveal nothing unusual. But Jesus wasn't born in 1 AD. Our modern calendar was worked out in the 6th century by a scholarly monk named Dennis the Little, who simply added the reigns of kings together. But historians have since discovered that he miscalculated by half a dozen years. So Jesus was actually born six years earlier than the history books tell us. When Molnar looked at his charts for the year 6 BC, he discovered that on April the 17th, Jupiter was in. To the astrologers of the time, it would have been a sign that a big royal event was looming. But there were even more regal portents on that day. Saturn came into Aries. So did the Sun. Then the Moon eclipsed and revealed Jupiter, yet another favorable sign. The dawn brought even more meaning to the ancients. It was a symbol of birth. On that day, Jupiter emerged as a morning star. This was the most powerful time to bring about the birth of a king. These collectively indicated the birth of a super king, if you will, the Messiah. This set of alignments may have escaped modern astronomers but it would most certainly have impressed first-century astrologers. Especially if the astrologers were wise men traveling from the east. East of Judea lay Babylon, the birthplace of astrology, and Persia, where it also flourished. The wise men who, according to Matthew's Gospel, carried gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, may well have been astrologers traveling to greet the new king. With the help of local guides, perhaps some of them did set off across the desert to Judea. Clues to the route they may have taken may lie in the origin of their gifts. Today, gold, frankincense, and myrrh can all be found in Jerusalem bazaars. This is myrrh, 
a type of scented oil used in antiquity for anointing kings. And this is frankincense, a bitter-tasting gum collected from Arabian trees. When burned, it gives off an exotic smell. It was used to purify temples. It's still used in many churches. But frankincense and burr weren't freely available in the first century. They were precious and extremely hard to find. Frankincense and myrrh were actually grown not in the east, but in the very south of Arabia. A detour for anyone traveling from the east to Judea. But historical research shows that these gifts could have been bought in root. Hidden in the southern canyons of modern Jordan are the remains of the capital of the old kingdom of the Nabataeans, an ancient trading city of Petra, a civilization which flourished 2,000 years ago. It's the one place where archaeologists know frankincense and myrrh were traded. By the time Jesus was born, Petra was the major caravan city in the ancient world. All trade from Arabia passed through Petra, giving the Nabataeans a near total monopoly on frankincense and myrrh. It makes Petra not only the most likely route from the east, but also a great place for the wise men to do their shopping. If the birth of Jesus was heralded, even if only by three astrologers, there's no evidence in the Gospels that Jesus grew up knowing he was special. Babies born today in Bethlehem usually start life in modern maternity hospitals. But the circumstances of Jesus' birth were humble and contentious. His mother Mary was said to be unmarried at the time of his conception, a fact that would have attracted as much scorn 2,000 years ago as it still does in 21st century Palestine, maybe more. Even today, traditional Palestinians believe that all babies like this must be conceived in wedlock if their mothers want to avoid severe reprisals. Nadira Shalhoub Kavorkian is an expert on the status of women in Palestine. A young woman that is pregnant uh, and she's not married, that means that the family failed to protect her. That means that the man, the male honor, has been actually somebody has hurt his honor. And it's very shameful, so it brings lots of shame. A woman pregnant before marriage could find herself thrown down a well. The last case of the 17-year-old, the father knowing that she lost her virginity. And uh, they took her to two doctors and both gynecologists told him that she lost her virginity. So he ended up taking her at night, cutting her head and throwing her head totally, separating the head from the body. In Mary's day, honor killings were backed by the law, which prescribed death by stoning. She would have been killed, she would have been... It, it might have caused a scandal, the social reaction would be extremely problematic, and she would have been accused of bringing shame and dishonor to the family. Perhaps the fact that Mary lived to tell the tale was thanks to Joseph. The Gospels say he kept the news of Mary's pregnancy secret, and he married her before she gave birth. 
And yet when the Gospels of Matthew and Luke were written 40 years after Jesus' death, they claimed that Jesus was born of a virgin and conceived by God. There's no direct scientific evidence to support a virgin birth, and skeptics claim the story was made up in hindsight to promote the divinity of Jesus. But to even suggest at the time that Mary's conception occurred out of wedlock would have been madness, for it would have left the fledgling new religion of Christianity wide open to ridicule. But the Gospel writers did it anyway. They must have genuinely believed the story was true. Now science is weighing in. At the University College in London, one expert supports the story of the virgin birth. Sam Berry is a genetics professor here. His area of expertise is biological reproduction. Births from virgins are found in thousands of species in the animal world, in fish, reptiles, and in insects. They are biologically possible. But it's a huge leap from insects and reptiles to humans. And there is a further obstacle. In the animal world, the offspring of virgin births are always female. Barry has identified two rare biological conditions under which a mother like Mary could have given birth to a baby boy. First, Mary would have had to been born with both a female and a male chromosome, an X and a Y. Now, there are women who um, have male chromosomes, who, instead of having two X chromosomes, like a normal female, have an X and a Y. This happens to about one in every five million women. Further complicating his theory is this. The overwhelming majority of such women are born without a womb. To have a child, a woman would have to be born with at least a rudimentary womb. And this, Berry argues, is biologically possible. These women have a lot of variation in their physical structure. I mean, some of them have no womb at all. Some of them have a rudimentary womb. Uh, some have a rather better one. Uh, there is uh, a possibility that the womb could be functional. There could be functional ovaries just as a result of the normal range of variation. Barry is the first to admit how improbable all these scenarios are. But he insists that a virginal conception must now be seen as a biological anomaly and no longer a biological impossibility. Dr. Mark Goodacre, a biblical scholar from Birmingham University in England, has found that even in the first and second century, stories of the virgin birth faced harsh ridicule. Jesus' opponents in John's Gospel were basically saying, you are born, not uh, of ordinary human parents, but of fornication. Celsus says that it's uh, all to do with Mary having had an illicit union with a Roman soldier. Tertullian says, you know, this is your son of a harlot. In other words, the virginal conception is not the kind of thing that you make up lightly. It's not the kind of thing that, uh, you know, you want to sort of uh, trumpet from the rooftops. That friend and foe actually agree is strong evidence that the gospel writers didn't make up Jesus' conception out of wedlock. But how that conception happened, historians cannot say. We didn't have, you know, cameras there. We didn't have uh, tape recordings. We didn't have interviews with the parents. So the historian can only go so far. But uh, it, I suppose it's the moment, if you like, where um, faith, if you like, begins to play a role in history.
One thing is certain, though. It wasn't long before Joseph and Mary took their new baby 100 miles away, to a new town and a new life. And archaeology can tell us much about the place where he grew up. To the north of Bethlehem lies Nazareth in Galilee. All the Gospels agree that this was the place where Jesus grew up. Modern Nazareth is now a thriving town of 60,000 people. It's hard to get a sense of what it was like during the time of Jesus. It has few ancient remains, so unlike Bethlehem, it has never quite managed to attract as many pilgrims or tourists. The village is being reconstructed by studying the remains of first century villages found across Galilee. The smallest details have been identified, the plastered walls, the size of windows. The team has also begun working with local people to turn the village into a living museum. Ancient implements and customs described in religious texts provide clues to farming life at the time of Jesus. By all accounts, it was an ordinary rural family life. It's a little known fact, but according to the Gospels, Jesus had two sisters whose names are not recorded, and four brothers named James, Jude, Joseph, and Simeon. Whether the siblings were Mary's children or Joseph's from a previous marriage, we'll never know. Like all children, Jesus played children's games. Historians now know what kind of games they were. Ancient Roman and Jewish sources indicate to historian Joshua Swartz that they played with toys similar to those of today, dolls, pets, and balls. In time, this ordinary boy from a rural backwater became a public figure who drew huge crowds. So something must have stirred his determination to right the wrongs he saw in his society. Luke's Gospel tells us of an experience that might just have started the boy on his fateful journey. When Jesus was 12, his parents took him to Jerusalem for the annual festival of Passover. Inside the walls of the old city, the atmosphere of ancient Judea survives. But the heart of first century Jerusalem, the Jewish temple, was destroyed long ago. It was built on a mountaintop, where the Dome of the Rock now stands. All that's left of the Temple Mount are the walls, where to this day, Jews gather to pray. We don't know what Jesus thought of Jerusalem. Little is left of what was said to be one of the most beautiful cities in the ancient world. Hanan Ishel is one of a long line of archaeologists who have been excavating old Jerusalem since early in the 19th century. Over the last 200 years, archaeologists have found remains of arches, columns, pillars, stairs, cisterns, and more. The works of Josephus and old first-century Jewish texts have left us detailed accounts of the architecture and appearance of the temple. So archaeologists are now confident they can accurately recreate what the young Jesus saw. We can see that in the wall just behind me, there are some stones which are sticking out. This is the beginning of an arch that uh, the staircase was built on top of them, of this arch, in order to lead to the southern part of the Temple Mount. This is Robinson's Arch, named after the archaeologist who first identified it in 1839. 
He matched the archaeological remains with Josephus' descriptions to produce a blueprint of a monumental staircase. Subsequent generations of archaeologists have since produced a blueprint of the whole Temple Mount. Begun in 20 BC, this was the brainchild of Herod the Great, a tyrant who ruled Judea on behalf of the Romans. The brand new temple was the headquarters of the Jewish faith. It must have been awesome to a young boy. One day, Jesus would return here to challenge everything that both the temple and the Jewish priest stood for. Ishel suspects that Jesus' interest in religion and politics may well have been sparked during this visit. But his fascination gave Mary and Joseph a shock too, according to Luke's Gospel. An incident occurred that may well have been his first political experience. Luke's Gospel says that when they began their journey back to Nazareth, Mary and Joseph realized they'd lost Jesus. Apparently, they found him in the temple, discussing religion with the learned priests. It's an engaging story. But could it really have happened? These are some of the original steps that led up to the temple. Evidence from Jewish writings suggests that rabbis used to gather on these steps to help pilgrims enter the temple. Hanan Ishel believes that Jesus may well have sat here to listen to one of the rabbis preaching. There was always conflict between pilgrims who wanted to enter and priests then the rabbis would have been here in order to make sure that as much peace people as possible are allowed to enter the Temple Mount. So the story in Luke about Jesus talking with some religious leaders might have happened here. It's one of the few clues that Gospels give about the education of Jesus. To know as much as he knows, you have only two options. God zapped him and told him everything he needed to know, or he spent a lot of time reading and studying and debating. The New Testament supports only the second one. Where does this man get such knowledge? He's not spending the whole day out there farming or fishing. He's studying and thinking, and he's discussing with the great minds. Safely back in Galilee, the education of Jesus would have continued to include lessons in carpentry so he could follow in the footsteps of his father. Nazareth is never mentioned in ancient histories of the Jews, giving the impression that Jesus grew up in a small and isolated place, far removed from the political turmoil that was ravaging the country. But just four miles away, on a hill, was another center of Jewish opulence. Sepphoris, the capital of Galilee. It's here that Jesus would have come face to face with the ruling class. It was the northern home of Herod Antipas, ruler of Galilee and son of Herod the Great. The historian Josephus described Sepphoris as the ornament of Galilee. Today the city is a ruin, but for the last 20 years, teams of archaeologists have been excavating the site. With the help of Josephus' descriptions, archaeological information, and the wonders of modern technology, we can reconstruct the way Sepphoris looked at the time of Jesus. Rising some 400 feet above the plain, it was a large city of about 10,000 people. There was a colonnaded main street with shops, where farmers from neighboring villages came to trade. 
When Herod Antipas inherited the kingdom of Galilee from his father, it's thought he converted the old arsenal into a fortified palace. Sepphoris is only about an hour's walk from Nazareth, but more significantly, it was built during the time that Jesus was growing up. Historians believe Jesus probably came here with his father, either to look, to trade, or work. As carpenters, they would have been able to find work in Sepphoris. It's been his passion for over a decade. He believes the spectacle of the town would have affected any youth deeply. Coming and meeting the royal family processing down one of these streets must have had an enormous impact on a young young man such as Jesus would have been when he visited. And uh, you can imagine what this might mean in England or in any other country where royalty exists. Myers has also found these baths used by priests for ritual purification. The priests controlled the access to the temple in Jerusalem. One day, Jesus would take issue with them. Some of the priestly families who settled here had uh, excessive wealth. And I think seeing such well-to-do established families, unlike the people who were living in the hamlets around and eking out a living um, such as his family would have done, and uh, this might have left a bad um, feeling in Jesus' mind. In fact, Josephus writes that when Jesus was a child, there was an uprising against the palace. The Romans retaliated by burning the city to the ground. Galilee was, at different times, a hotbed of religious and political discontent. The cliffs around the Sea of Galilee are dotted with hundreds of caves. They were the hideaways of Jewish rebels against the Romans. They were suitably inaccessible and were often only reached by means of a rope lowered down from a cliff top. Rebellion was not new, but hadn't been successful. The Jews had been fighting invading armies for centuries. All their hopes were pinned on a savior. They had a special name for the savior they longed for. They called him the Anointed One. In Hebrew, the Messiah. In Greek, the Christ. writings have been found about Jesus' life until he nears the age of around 30. And when they appear, it's to tell us about the baptism of Jesus that could have been the turning point of his life. The Gospels say that a man called John started baptizing crowds in the River Jordan. John was offering to cleanse people's sins in readiness for the arrival of the long-awaited Messiah. The Gospels say that one day Jesus too was baptized by John. Proving the existence of the baptismal site has been difficult. One of the most promising locations was the holy place where according to ancient tradition, the Hebrews crossed into the Promised Land. It's between Mount Nebo, where Moses died, and Jericho. Sixth-century church books mentioned pilgrimages to the baptismal site, 
Citing them, archaeologists hope to find the remains of churches and monasteries. But excavating on either side of the Jordan remained a problem. For 50 years, the Jordan was a front line in the Arab-Israeli conflict, and so it was a no-go area for archaeologists. But after peace was declared in 1994, the Jordanians cleared the landmines on their side and started to dig. Seven years later, they found what they were looking for. The telltale remains of a pilgrimage site dated to between the 3rd and 6th centuries AD. At count, these included seven churches, a monastery, and facilities for pilgrims. And there was one more surprise. Rami Khoury is a Jordanian historian who has been monitoring the excavations since they began. He believes the evidence that clinched it was the discovery of this pool for pilgrims to reenact the baptism of Jesus. There are other uh, pools in the monastery that were used clearly for storage of water or as wells or as cisterns. So you have big pools like this that were clearly used for baptism. Mainly the evidence is the long internal staircases for people to walk into it for full immersion baptism. Instead of going public, the Gospels say that Jesus mysteriously withdraws into the desert where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. There, it is said that he was tempted by the devil with abundant food, immortality, and all the riches and glory in the world. Biblical scholars believe that the temptation symbolized Jesus' dilemma. He was wrestling with a big decision, the biggest decision of his life. What kind of Messiah to be? The temptations, food, wealth, glory, hint that Jesus was being tempted by the trappings of power. I think there was a temptation there to lead a military or a very powerful political move. But then he realized what he had seen as a young boy, the burning of Sephora's. He realized that those who live by the sword are going to die by the sword. Luke says he would often spend all night in prayer. Mark says he would get up very early, long, long before dawn, and go out and meditate in prayer and think. So we have a human. Let's not forget the humanness of Jesus. I think he's trying to find out what am I to do? His decision would have fateful consequences. His words and actions galvanized large crowds who saw him as their long-awaited savior. But they would also put Jesus on a collision course with death.